but then... Christine. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh. Thanks for coming into the Space of Media Studio uh, lunchtime talk. This is the first time I've done this in nearly three months. And it's the first one since, uh, it's the first one of the autumn season. Um, these are live every Friday at 1pm. That's great, what an audience. <laughs> That's way more enthusiasm than I was expecting. Um, so whether you're in Bristol or far away, we are online or in the building and you can join in the conversation. Uh, my name's Luke. Uh, I am the Faces Media Studio producer. Um, and every Friday we throw open the doors of the studio for Open Studio Friday. As some of you already know because you're here for that, but those of you who don't, you are welcome to come and spend every Friday of the year, apart from the Fridays in August, uh, with us from 10 to 5 p.m. to use our desks and meet our community and find out more about what we do. Um, you don't have to book, you can just turn up. Um, an especially big welcome to anyone who's new. Uh, the studio, if you are new to what we do, is a diverse and collaborative community celebrating creativity and technology uh, with everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art. Uh, we are a partnership between the two universities of Bristol, that's UE and UAB, and the watershed. And ultimately, we're a space for people to take risks with embryonic ideas that are in the realms of creativity and technology and to make time for collaboration. That's a really key thing for us, collaboration. So a quick bit of housekeeping. Feel free to move around. This is a fairly relaxed space, so if you need a cup of tea at any point or want some water, help yourself at the back there, something you already have, which is great. Um, there's a quiet space just literally on the other side of this wall, so if you need a timeout at any point, you do not need to explain, just pull the door shut and go and do that. Um, fire exits are either in the studio, we probably won't need them though. You'll hear a loud noise if we do. Um, and accessible toilets and baby changer at the back. Um, there's a QA and a at the end of the talk, as there is with every talk, so if you have questions, please raise your hand and I'll come to you. We've got a microphone so the people online can hear the people in the building. And if you're online, pop them in the chat and Martin will ask them for you on your behalf. Um, before we start, next week's talk asks, should Bristol install a portal to the world? So Daryl and Benedictas from the Portable Unity Network will be joining us to tell us all about their portal-based explorations. Um, we have a host of other public events, which some of you may know about, but I'm just going to highlight. Um, first Friday this evening, which is our monthly first Friday of every month, the clue is in the name, opportunity to come in and meet some residents, see some of the work they do and network with other people in creativity, creative and technological industries. Um, Makeshift, which is our new uh, monthly event for people 18 to 30 who are young creatives to come in and talk to us about what they do. Um, we have producer Wednesdays for any of you producers out there. There's a big demand for producers in Bristol across all industries. And we have residents who need producers. So every Wednesday, producers can turn up and hang out in our space and be ready to have a conversation with residents. And our residents come along on a Wednesday hoping to meet people as well. So please tell your friends about those if you think they might be interested. And just very quickly, one other thing, we are recruiting. So if you've ever wanted to work in a place like this, we're currently recruiting for a new studio coordinator. The deadline is in two weeks. More information on that sign just there as you walk out or on our website or come and chat to me if you're interested. Um, you can get news on all our future events and anything else that we announce, articles that we put up, blog posts, other public sharings of residence works on our website at watershed.co.uk forward slash studio, uh, at PM Studio UK on Twitter and at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram. Before, oh no, I'm just reading my notes of the thing I've already just said. It's been three months. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Um, Dr. Liz Roberts is going to present on the Alternatives at Scale project, uh, which identifies opportunities for change and dialogue within the creative sector in the Southwest to create a fairer and more creative economy. So I'm going to hand you over now to Liz. Round of applause for Liz, please. Hey, um, first off, thanks to The Watershed for inviting me today. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming along. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about a project that I've been working on for about a year, year and a half, um, which is looking at how we can try and support a fairer creative economy in Bristol and Bath. So I'm going to introduce myself, uh, talk a little bit about the project, um, and then the bulk of the presentation is going to focus on two, bless you, <laughs> review papers um, that I published last week. And then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about how that's going to feed into the new My World program that we're working on. OK, so um, I work in the Creative Economies Lab, which is part of the Digital Cultures Research Centre, um, part of the University of West of England, which is based here in the watershed. Um, and since I joined in 2019, I've been part of three major research and development programs. 
Um, so the Southwest Creative Technology Network completed last year. The Bristol and Bath Creative R&D programme is running to the end of this year. And then um, over the last six months or so, we've just been um, starting off on the new My World programme. Uh, so Bristol University leads My World, but um, the UE and especially the Creative Economies Lab has been leading on uh, the Southwest Creative Technology Network and the Bristol and Bath programme. Um, so these are programmes that uh, uh, bring uh, universities together with creative and cultural industries uh, for knowledge exchange and particularly around creative technology innovation. <coughs> So the Creative Economies Lab, for those of you that don't know, it, it's kind of quite unique in terms of an academic department um, because it's uh, made up of researchers and then non-academics that are helping do a lot of the delivery of these programmes alongside our colleagues in Watershed. Um, so we work really closely um, with kind of non-academic partners as well. Um, so yeah, Creative Economies Lab have been leading these uh, big R&D programmes and as part of the team that means I've been responsible for um, trying to do overarching research on these programmes, kind of monitoring them, um, evaluating them and trying to map all the amazing activity and impacts uh, that come out of programmes like these. Um, so we kind of sit within this strange uh, space really of basically trying to deliver an economic development programme. It is essentially economic development, um, whilst at the same time kind of being aware of our own sets of values and our own motivations that drive us to participate in these programmes and understanding all the amazing non-economic impacts and activity that happens as a res result of them as well. Um, and also trying to make the process as ethical as possible in the running of these programmes. Um, and that's really underpinned by our understanding of creative ecologies. So what the, the kind of thinking behind the creative ecologies is, is it sort, of, it sort of understands the creative sector in Bristol and Bath as being like an ecosystem. It already exists and programmes like Bristol and Bath can kind of support and intervene and, and help, help that system. Um, so it's messy and emergent. R&D happens in a messy and emergent way. It's, everything is interconnected and interdependent rather than this kind of uh, policy narrative that you get about more linear um, notions of R&D, where it's like money in, some kind of innovation happens, money out the other end. Um, so I just wanted to show this um, map. It's some work that we did as part of the Southwest Creative Technology Network. And what it tries to do is visualise those different values that I was just talking about. So obviously our participants are really grateful for the money we give them. I'm not saying they're not, but when we ask them about what was important to them when they were participating, they talk about lots of other types of value. They talk about um, inspirational conversations they had. They talk about feeling supported um, and belonging and being part of a community. They talk about mentoring opportunities where they've had opportunities for guidance and training and then also just being able to have that time to actually develop some more sustained long-term um, connections and collaborations with people that then can lead on to bids and things like that so it's all very interconnected um, so if you're interested in that work there's more about it in the um, final report that we did for that program which is on the network's website. It's also on the Creative um, Economies Lab website as well. But I just wanted to show that as an example to show that kind of overarching research that we're doing about the cultural and creative industries. So it sort of helps understand where the project that I'm talking about today has come from. <coughs> so um, it kind of ended up with this um, shorthand title of Alternatives at Scale, which may not make much sense at the moment, but hopefully will by the end of the talk. Um, and as I said, obviously working with the Creative Economies Lab, working with these creative businesses and freelancers, working in the Bristol and Bath region, we've been really aware through these programmes of how precarious and insecure creative work can be. Um, kind of... Uh, 
going on that treadmill of constantly being bidding for your, for your next bit of work or your next grant whilst at the same time trying to do your day job um, and how actually the way the system works is it can play to the advantage of bigger companies that are being propped up by this kind of messy creative ecosystem in the region. So, you know, it's increasingly made us think about what our own role as a funder in the region is in sort of reinforcing those patterns and, and what more we could do to try and challenge that. Um, so the creative economy, as we all know, it's very much celebrated as a high growth sector in the UK. Um, economic growth is what success is measured on, primarily in this sector. But with the companies that we were talking to, we found that actually not all of them are interested in growing as fast as they can or growing in the way that the government wants them to. So all of this kind of thinking and work has led to um, my research questions, which are what types of narratives are articulated around economic growth and growth alternatives? What is the role of the creative economy within those narratives? And then how does that look in the Bristol and Bath region? So what are these kind of intersecting scales and, and points for intervention within that? So it's all ongoing work, but this is the culmination of it so far. Um, so these two review papers were published last week. They're on the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D blog, and they're on the Creative Economies uh, Lab website. And I've put links at the end as well on the, my last slide. Um, so you can find them there. But the orange one is a strategy review paper. So that looked at economic plans, cultural plans, and what I'm calling sort of renewal recovery plans post-pandemic within um, Bristol and Bath. And then the blue one is a literature review. So that was really trying to set our own thinking and practices within the wider context of these overlapping uh, debates that can, that can feed into helping us think about how to make a fairer, more inclusive, greener, creative economy. So I'd set myself a huge task, obviously, with the literature review. I'm going to talk about that one first. Um, there was loads of literature that I could think about <laughs> with this. Um, and I really wanted to try and situate us and what we were doing um, and find out, identify what was useful, what wasn't perhaps, say, relevant for our context, that kind of thing. Um, but after immersing myself for a bit in all these different types of literatures, I realised that it's a little bit more difficult to delineate between them than I realised because when you get to that sort of stage of um, going from the abstract, theoretical, more conceptual discussions into when they're being applied as analyses or frameworks for thinking about particular activities, it's not so hard to separate them out, say several being looked at to study the same thing or there's a lot of um, kind of overlap and grey areas between them. So, what I decided to do was just slice through it all, and I identified four motifs that kept, to my mind, recurring across the literatures. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. But before I do that, and this is what the literature review does as well, it sort of takes a step back. I think it's important to kind of think about this economic context that we find ourselves in, so this neoliberal, capitalist, high growth, high productivity agenda that, um, you know, it, it dictates how the creative sector works, it, it dictates how Bristol and Bath R&D programmes like that run and what we kind of count as important and um, tell our funder about, who in turn tell the government about. So, I think we're all sort of aware of um, that context and the fact that it's quite problematic in some cases, but don't necessarily think about why it is the way it is or, or what we could do to change it potentially. So, um, the literature on this um, tries to kind of debunk and unpack some of these economic narratives that are so powerful in informing everything. And I found a book by Tim Jackson called Prosperity Without Growth, 
was really helpful for doing that, and he uses economic modelling uh, to try and um, debunk what he calls these myths. Um, so just to give you an example of the kind of thing he's doing, uh, he shows how markets don't necessarily have to be unregulated to grow, they don't have to be growing to be stable, um, happiness and inequality aren't reliant on growth, so it's not kind of like exponentially improving, but it's diminishing returns after a certain point. And um, also with technology, these efficiencies that we're all pinning on our, our hopes on to try and um, you know, make sure that we don't outgrow the planet, actually um, within the current um, way things are, we're not even going to meet the targets that governments are agreeing on, let alone what actually needs to happen um, to not outgrow the planet. And then there's also the people that think that population decline is going to sort of de-risk it all anyway uh, and remove that risk of us outgrowing the planet. So this is the kind of um, thing. There's others also that are doing a lot of this work to try and unpack some of this economic context that underpins everything. Um, even so, these remain really powerful uh, narratives that are underpinning everything. And this is because they've become so naturalised and so um, kind of entrenched in our society that they've become like this common sense language, sorry, logic. Um, and that's because of the way they're shaped through our language um, and the way that language then shapes our own identities. So we actually sort of identify ourselves through this economic language and logic. Uh, so we're all supposed to identify with this idea of like the rational man, so we're sort of self-interested, driven by competition, driven by instrumentality, all of these things, there's a name for it, homo economicus. Um, and so what this work does is try to show how this isn't some kind of universal law or truth, but it's actually historically contingent. These are things that have developed over the last couple of hundred years. Okay, but they're still really hard to undo and try and imagine otherwise because of how pervasive it is. Okay, so that's kind of like the background um, in order to then, I think, go on to start thinking about what alternatives could be. Um, and there are some groups that are thinking about alternatives, as we know. And in the literature, these groups are referred to often as autonomous communities. So autonomous communities are groups that are kind of operating under their own rules. Um, they're self-regulating, self-governing. It could be a co-housing group. It could be um, an eco-community, a workers' cooperative, or an activist network. So they can be operating at different scales, um, but they've all in some way kind of rejected the status quo system so whether that be housing systems, agri-food agri systems, or employment, which, of course, in turn are all underpinned by this sort of economic logic that I've just been talking about. So the literature around these um, autonomous communities, um, there's some kind of tensions within that. So some, some people are arguing that these groups don't really have potential to scale they're accused of being too localised or too insular sometimes, or almost to the point of being exclusionary. But then it raises the question of whose responsibility actually is it um, to be trying to affect wider change? Is participating in trying to enact those alternatives in a group, is that kind of activist and a political action in and of itself? Or, do, or should these be groups be trying to mainstream their activity? Um, so the research is starting to think about how these groups can scale, how you can bring together disparate, heterogeneous groups that are motivated by their own sets of values in a more inclusive way that kind of starts to cultivate a more global sense of connection between them. Um, so that's kind of thinking about if you're kind of trying to operate outside of the system, how do you then speak back to the system? So that was the first motif. The second motif I'm calling nowtopias. Hmm. 
So in, in um, a lot of this autonomous communities, uh, a byline of those groups is to be the change you want to see. Um, so that's what this idea of Nautopias is trying to get at, really. It's this idea of collectively experimenting with alternatives. Uh, so it's not thinking about necessarily a kind of fixed blueprint of um, some sort of utopian vision of the future that you're working towards, but is down the line somewhere. But it's actually, you know, how can you experiment and trial with alternatives, work out what does and doesn't work in the present moment, um, working towards a future that we don't ne yet know, because we don't exactly know the combinations of things that are going to work. Um, so that's uh, kind of what the work around Notopia is. There's lots of different um, sets of literature which are, literatures which are talking about approximately the same thing. Um, and I've grouped them under this category of Notopias. Another thing that this set of literature is interested in is actually how you go about um, sort of working collectively to try and enact some change within the group. So it's not some easy process. You don't just go and like rock up to your co-housing group and everything goes very smoothly. There's often negotiations that have to happen. There's compromises. Um, there's new ways of being that have to be established um, so that the group can work towards shared intentions, develop shared values and goals. So that's quite interesting in thinking about that real micro-social level of relationship of how you actually make change happen. OK, so these are my four motifs. I've talked a little bit about autonomous communities, how and if they should be scaling. Um, Nowtopias, so this idea of experimenting in the now to try and find um, alternatives. And then the final motifs are um, making visible and rethinking. Um, so how do you actually help to make alternatives more visible? And another way we might ask that is, as a university or as a cultural organisation, what role do we have to help make alternatives more visible? Is there a space for us to be experimenting with alternatives? And can we be the agents of change? And what is our position of power to speak to policy makers in the region, for example. So these are the kinds of things that we're, we're thinking about. But on the motif of making visible, I wanted to share one really positive example, I think. So some of you may be familiar uh, with Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics. And I'm sharing this because I think it's a really powerful visualisation of um, one of those alternative narratives to this kind of economic growth agenda and um, it's really captured people's imaginations it's kind of internationally recognized now um, it's trying to tell a different story about the economy in a much more holistic way and it, it has done some of that work in mainstreaming in a way it's informing a lot of work and even some policy I think so I just briefly wanted to show that one before moving on to another visualization that I want to spend a bit longer on. So this is what I'm calling the iceberg economy. And it's um, based on two work by two geographers, Gibbs and Graham. And what this does is it shows that that formal economy, the neoliberal capitalist market driven economy is up at the top. It's the tip of the iceberg. So it's what's visible. So, and it's what counts. So that might be things like um, waged labor counting as um, national employment statistics, or it might be production and consumption counting as gross domestic product. So these are the things that are written about. These are the things that count and inform policy. Whereas what Gibson Graham says, is actually, there's all this other diverse practices around the economy, um, different types of economic practice, different forms of value circulating, different types of exchange and interaction that happen outside of that kind of growth economy. And where can we look for the opportunities um, to try and make some of these examples more visible and more credible 
and more knowable so that they can sort of start to mainstream? How can we make them count more? Whilst also acknowledging that actually the stuff that's happening underneath the waterline is kind of complicit in that formal economy as well, because it does a lot of work in terms of propping it up and allowing to, it to work in the way that it does work. But it's starting to think more about how people relate and connect to each other outside of these neoliberal capitalist growth agendas. And so it's, it forces us to start thinking differently. So instead of that sort of rational, self-interested, competitive me thinking, we start to have to do a bit more we thinking, so more kind of collective um, thinking around um, recognising mutuality, recognising interdependencies. Um, so it's really kind of like a, a multi-species collectivity, uh, not just human to human but thinking at an ecosystemic level. So it does, it does good work in terms of like uh, bringing the economy back into the ecosystem so it's not this sort of separate abstracted sphere over there that doesn't need to worry too much about the impact it's having on the environment, but actually again showing that interdependency of all these things together. Um, so what I want to do in the work going forward is to actually try and map on some of these alternative practices that the creative sector in Bristol and Bath are doing. So that might be, you know, where are the creative cooperatives in Bristol and Bath? Who is driving that type of activity? Um, where are creatives working in kind with each other? Where are they bartering for different skills and resources? What are the networks and tools that allow them, for them to do that? Uh, where are they participating in care work? So where are they doing things like unpaid mentoring or looking after a colleague's child so that colleague can go off and meet a client, for example, things like this? And then is there spaces for childcare or nursery provision in creative organisations or creative spaces in Bristol and Bath, and, and how could we work towards making that kind of thing more possible? Um, so that's one way in that I'm trying to move this work forward, think about how we can apply this sort of visualisation within the creative sector. Another way we're doing this is um, to hold a conference. <laughs> so. Um, I don't expect you to read everything on there, by the way. It's just a screenshot of um, the Creative Economies Lab has got all the information about the conference if you're interested. Um, but it's just a, an opportunity to bring a load of people together, um, to learn from each other, to try and celebrate success stories, think about what works, and to build a bit of a critical mass, I suppose, so that it is making it more visible. Um, what do I need to say about it? It's in March next year. Uh, the deadline for proposals is in a month's time. Um, and yeah, we want a really diverse set of people there. So it's not just for academics, it's practitioners, creative practitioners, third sector practitioners as well. So that should be really good. Um, okay, so this is where I've got to with the um, work so far. So this is very much work in progress, but it's trying to get somewhere towards a framework for thinking about how we get to a fairer creative economy. So how do you bring care into creative spaces and creative workforces? Uh, how do you make sure it's meaningful so people aren't alienated? Um, how can we make sure we're creating lots of different types of value, not just extracting value for economic gains and then how do we link with Bristol and Bath's already quite vibrant alternative and activist networks so that we're really linking in and working together not sort of working in a siloed way um, and then hopefully that leads to um, more redistributing and localizing of wealth creation in the region uh, it's um, it means we're sort of creating surplus and um, helping towards recovery of damage already done, 
And then we're also thinking about this different type of language and how you build that. And that would be very iterative as well. So yeah, love to hear feedback on this. Should have said earlier, I'd love to hear any examples if people have from the iceberg of different things happening in Bristol and Bath as well. Um, Okay, so that was a whistle stop tour through the lit review. And now I'm going to move on to talking about the strategy review a bit more. Um, so this, again, this is online. Um, so it took in economic plans, cultural plans, and recovery renewal plans post pandemic. Um, so Bristol and Bath councils, the West of England combined authority, and then the Western Gateway as well, which um, incorporates parts of South Wales. And that's all set within this sort of national uh, context of levelling up. Um, as with anything related to policy, it's probably already out of date. We're about to get a new prime minister, <laughs> so um, who knows what kind of impact that's going to have. Um, but it, it sort of represents that moment, sort of mid-pandemic, where we, we took pause and, and there was this opportunity to think about the economy differently and uh, didn't necessarily work out that well or come to fruition the way we might have hoped but some of those things do hold true. So the aim of the review was to look for where inclusive green renewal narratives overlapped with growth narratives and, um, and the creative sector, narratives around the creative sector. And I'll give you a quick summary of the findings. So you won't be surprised to hear probably not too many of these documents. We're trying to rock the economic boat in any kind of way. It's all very much um, high growth across most policy domains. Um, there's a lot of promising uh, green inclusive uh, talk. Um, but it's quite narrowly conceived, actually, in terms of what, what is actually meant by that. And I talk about that a bit more in the review paper. And um, I found that the understanding of the contribution that the creative and cultural industries could make to these conversations were quite underdeveloped. So, um, you know, being a little bit reductive, but it amounts to making sure theatres are retrofitted and the arts festivals have carbon plans and that kind of thing. But I think if we do that mapping work, we can provide a much more comprehensive response to that, whilst also acknowledging that the creative sector is made up of a lot of small businesses, freelancers, and is it really fair to put any responsibility on them for participating in that when they've already got sort of criteria to meet around social impact and their funding and that kind of thing? in the grant application, so sort of recognising all of that as well. So this was the major output uh, from, the, from the review. Um, it, it looks at all the different schemes that tie into those three narratives that I talked about, um, where they're intersected and overlapping and, and what sort of opportunities there are with them, within those going forward. To, um, to sort of be creating interventions and, and trying to speak to those different people. Um, I found within the document some glimmers of opportunity. So um, <laughs> things like community asset transfer, that's kind of interesting across several different scales. Um, much more joined up cultural placemaking and then one really specific one, um, I think, was in one of the Weka documents, was uh, tailored training for creatives in green technology. Um, so it's like interesting things going on, but it's very much one-off projects rather than being embedded across policy. Probably the inclusion um, aspect is a bit more embedded across than the green, I'd say. But, um, yeah, and also there's kind of that mismatch sometimes of the language that's being used and the intention with when you look at the timelines and the actions that are actually being taken. Um, yeah, so that's where I am so far with it all. It's very much like continuing on. 
Um, and, <laughs> and it's going to be feeding into a, um, a work package that we're running. Um, myself, uh, my colleague Simon Morton, Melissa Blackburn, and then we're working on this with um, Professor Martin Parker over at Bristol Uni. So it's, um, the, the work package is called Fair Creative Economies. Um, it's running as part of the My World programme for the next sort of three years or so, I think. And we're looking to take forward this work now. So um, working in a lot more engaged way, a lot more in depth with um, stakeholders, um, interviewing and workshopping. So if anyone thinks of anyone it would be really good to link to or would like to be part of this work, please let me know. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there, but I'm happy to talk more about what that work will involve if people are interested. Thanks, Liz. Round of applause for Liz, please. <laughs> so at this stage, we are open for questions. Um, I'm going to kick us off, if that's all right. So I was really interested to hear you use the phrase, be the change you want to see. It's a very common activist phrase. Mm. One of the questions that comes up for me is, how do, how do you think people can conceive of actual change they can see that comes as a result of this kind of um, research? How do I think... How, do, how can people see the real-world effects of this kind of research? Like, I think that's part of that making that sort of more visible and more knowable, so working with things like how you can sort of visualise and create new language around it. Um, that's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> Straight <laughs> off the bat, sorry. Anyone else want to throw a little bit of a softball to kick us off? Uh, just wait for the microphone to come to you if that's all right. Thank you. Um, yeah, just I don't know if this relates to what you said, Luke, but um, just some I would love some more concrete examples, like specific examples of, of when you went back to that other slide. Um, yes, that, 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 this, oh. that no, sorry. Which <laughs> the, one? The last one. That um, one? No, the, no. The Venn diagram, just to make specific ah. examples of more information about what these things actually are. Um, so these are all kind of schemes or initiatives or strategies that um, Bristol City Council is working towards or um, Bath and North East Somerset or the West of England Combined Authority. Um, so in the strategy review, if you, if you look online, there's actually a breakdown, a summary table of the main things across each of these different sort of scales of decision making. Um, so a lot of um, the activity in Weka is happening around like the Grace Hub, um, uh, creative scale up and workforce for the pro um, workforce for the future programs. Um, uh, Watershed was, uh, and Dewey were part of running one of those programmes um, to support more inclusion in the creative sector. Um, is that the kind of thing you mean? Yeah, yeah like just some of these things. What, what is a compassionate community hub and like, what happens at one? Well, that is a good question. And the documents don't tell you that much. <laughs> so this is why I'm hoping to then be able to speak to people and, and engage with the people that are making these sorts of decisions. I really want actually to think about how you create that change in these types of decision-making organisations as well, where the kind of organisational narrative might be different to people's own beliefs or, or you know, what's driving them. So think about how you can actually create agents of change in these, in these types of organisations where change is historically quite slow to happen. Um, yeah, no, I can't tell you much more about the Compassionate Communities Hub, I'm afraid. <laughs> Any other questions from the room? Joe, and then we'll move online. Yep. Hi, Liz. Uh, thank you, that was great. Um, my question is something about like yours and your team's role in the work, I guess. I'm interested to hear a little bit more. I like the beginning of the framework that you're developing that was a few slides back. And I'm interested in a bit of like what happens in that arrow as you move from the side on the left to the side of the right. And, yeah. and I guess slightly implicit is how do you avoid a situation whereby by making the invisible more visible, you don't subject it to some of the same kind of scrutiny and metrics and targets 
yeah. that the more formal economy is is subjected to and therefore yeah. sort of ruin it. That, that is exactly <laughs> one of the things we're grappling with at the moment, actually. And it, it, yeah, about if you're wanting to try and speak to people, do you have to adopt a bit of their language so that they can sort of buy into it and and sort of understand what you're talking about? Or do you kind of reject that language altogether and ins insist on developing your own language at the risk that um, people just don't get it and they don't want to talk to you? Yeah, it's really difficult. And I think, yeah, within the team that we're working um, on this in my world, we're, yeah, we're just trying to work that out at the moment. And it's probably a bit of both, isn't it? Yeah, probably <laughs> for us. Maybe yeah. others can do the other thing. Yeah. Uh, Martin, something from YouTube? Yep, uh, we got a question here from Dave Webb, uh, who asks, is there any evidence of past programs, for example, Swifton, uh, creating a legacy of good practice for greener, more social or inclusive alternative practices in creative projects or business? Oof, you really are getting the questions, Liz. <laughs> I mean, yeah, just check out um, the <laughs> Swift and final report. You'll see it all there. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, in the Southwest Creative Technology Network, this is exactly the kind of thing that I'm, I was talking about in terms of that tension between delivering uh, an economic development programme and also trying to make sure that it reflects the values that we see in our team and, and our partners on that programme. So we had a particular funding stream that was focused on green technology as well, or had a lot of green technology um, projects within it. And, and part of the criteria of applying for a lot of these programs is to show that you're addressing um, certain issues around that as well. So, um, yeah, well, so what was it? Is there a legacy, or is that the main part of the question? Yeah, yeah, evidence yeah. of a legacy, I think. <laughs> uh, anyone else in the room? Hey. Um, I was just, just wondering how, uh, how we start to measure businesses, ideas, community projects against new metrics. Mm. So rather than how big are people's bank balances. Yeah. You know, how much money are they operating and what's their turnover? That's like, can we have a yeah. carbon figure for everyone or something like that? Yeah. The, the problem with if you start doing that though is you if you get into carbon accounting, you are still potentially sort of, you know, working along that kind of neoliberal capitalist sort of agenda if you're kind of trying to then sort of count things in that way. But um it's going to be a big part of our work going forward in my world is to think about different metrics. And um, there's loads of stuff that we can draw on from, for example, um, Wales's well-being kind of agenda. Um, in Bristol, there's uh, the Thriving Places Index. So we're going to be doing quite a lot of work and trying to pull together these different, um, these different metrics that are trying to yeah, capture different things, different forms of value and, and see whether there's something we can do with that. Another question? Um, this probably rolls on quite nicely from your question. Um, I work in placemaking and we sometimes work with big property developers who are starting to kind of see the value of thinking about the culture that goes on between the buildings that they're building. But we still struggle to kind of... To really convince them of the value of doing certain things. And I think what would be really useful for people like us would be to have some really good tools that are there. Because I'm a creative person, I'm not an economics person. So, you know, when we're talking to these people who are, you know, suits in boardrooms, how we can really explain to them in their language what the value of, you know, bringing in like a sort of a free creative workspace or something within within their developments would be I think having like useful tools that we can access to kind of vocalize that would be really helpful um I don't know if excellent yeah it, I think you no, I think answered that in the last question yeah no I think that's exactly the thing we're going to be trying to do a bit more of in um in in the work package in my world because it's been very much about like kind of situating ourselves and in in the work that I've been doing and and um you know seeing where we fit within the wider debates and what's useful. And I think going forward, it's going to be much more trying to kind of enact that a bit more and, and create those metrics and resources, hopefully.
There you go. There's a possible real world. Yeah, so we should talk more. <laughs> uh, any more questions from the room or online? Online? Yep. Uh, so Ruth Hennel asks, uh, when you talk about inclusion, what sort of people or groups are being targeted? And thinking specifically about how carers and the chronically ill are at risk, contributions are often ignored if unable to do uh, paid full-time work. I, um, I can talk about that with reference to the strategy review. I'd say it's very much targeted at um, like black and uh, minority ethnic um, type, like as in targeted training schemes or that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, there isn't much inclusion in the <laughs> inclusion policies sometimes that we're seeing, but um, yeah. And to be clear, that's things that Liz is looking at. She's not responsible for that, right? I'm not responsible yeah. for that. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more questions from the room? Uh, one at the back. Just wait for the microphone if you wouldn't mind. You spoke quite frequently about the use of language and the impact that has had both historically and how we see ourselves and the economy and how we define ourselves within the economy. Um, but also in some of the questions that the topic of language has come up, I wondered if that was at all part of your plans or whether you had thoughts on, I guess, where work related to language could go. Yeah, I think it is part of that, that question around metrics and resources and trying to think about what different language we can use and how we position ourselves as then in the region as well when we're trying to speak to people and share ideas about what language, yeah, what language we can use. Definitely, it's really, it's really important in that literature that I was talking about on, in terms of unpacking the narratives and the lo economic logics that we have now. Um, especially as a lot of that work is kind of emerging out of a post-structural moment where, you know, language and sort of relationality is really important as well. So, um, so I think that is um, where a lot of that comes from as well, but it's really important. For those that might not know, including myself, what, oh, is, post what, what is post structural? Oh, no, we can't do that now, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick, quick sentence on you that have 18 phrase. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, why did I even say that word? <laughs> it's just useful from an inclusion perspective. Yeah. So, oh, dear. Um, so, kind of thinking about how like meanings are fixed to things and how it might be a little bit more slippery than that and meanings are relational to different things. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, any more questions in the room? Simon, no? Okay. Martin, how far away? So uh, a lot of the ideas that you talked about at the beginning about sharing economies and so on have like long roots in the like, communist or anarchist thought and so on. Yeah, but yeah. But that, that language does not get used when you I, talk about this. I, yeah, deliberately didn't mention Marx. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering, to what extent do you see that as like a strategic move to yeah. make things more palatable? And how much do you think there's like a genuine break with those older forms of anti-capitalist thought? Yeah, I think there's definitely like factions within all of these sorts of narratives around these things, definitely. And it's sort of that, that Marxist socialist sort of legacy does definitely, yeah, float around in all of them and inform the way that the ideas and, are developed and things like that. But I think there is that sort of move away from it in terms of recognizing um, the sort of the need for that kind of global connecting across really heterogeneous, disparate groups and how actually that's kind of about celebrating diversity and inclusion um, as well alongside that. So, so yeah, it's definitely there, but I didn't focus on it today because that's just opening a whole other can of worms, <laughs> like mentioning post-structuralism. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. We'll draw to an end there. Big round of applause for Liz. And thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so next week's talk is all about opening a portal to the world from Bristol. Don't miss that. If you want to stay in hot desk, come and find me or Danielle at the back or Martin just here and we'll find you a space. And if you want to find out more about what we do, come find me and have a chat. Um, we'll see you all same time, same place next week. Woo!